G'day, and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2022 Slaves to the Darkness Battle Tome. In this video, I'm going to perform a great deed for the Dark Gods and gain their blessing by showcasing the Allegiance abilities, the enhancements including the new Ensorcelled Banners, the key War Scroll changes, and the points. Now, Games Workshop did send me a copy in advance. However, unlike Sigma, they won't be seeing this from Azir and will have no involvement in the video. This limited version of the Battle Tome is being released as a part of the Battle Box. It's unclear exactly when the book will be separate from this box, so I guess we'll just have to watch out for 2023 or at least some type of Warhammer Community article that we can share a little bit more. But in the meantime, I'll share with you all the rules and everything you need to know to really build up or start playing with your new Slaves to Darkness Force. But inside this book as well, there is a bunch of art, there's narrative, there's Path to Glory, there's a detailed map of Akshi, and a unique code for you to unlock your Age of Sigma rules in the AOS app. Starting at the Allegiance abilities, and we start off with six sub-factions known as Damned Legions, and we're going to talk a little bit about them later in this video. One of the big parts of your Allegiance ability is the Marks of Chaos. Now, some of your Slaves to Darkness units, when you're looking at the War Scrolls, may have these specific keywords, whether it be Undivided, Corn, Zinch, Nurgle, or Slanish. Now, when you see those keywords, they are marked to the Chaos God. For other units, you may see a keyword called the Mark of Chaos. Now, when you pick a unit that has the Mark of Chaos keyword as opposed to the Undivided, Corn, Zinch, blah, 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 you must pick one of the following keywords, Corn, Zinch, Slanish, Nurgle, or Undivided, and you get to write that down on your roster. The only caveat is that a wizard cannot be given the Corn keyword, so you can't make a Corn Sorcerer Lord, for example. Let's say as you're building your army, you choose a Chaos Knight unit, and you see when you look at their War Scroll, they have the Mark of Chaos keyword. When you put them onto your army roster, you will need to choose one of those five keywords. Now, could you take two units of Chaos Knights and mark one of them Slanesh and one of them Nurgle? Absolutely. Could you make them both corn? Yeah, you can do that too. So I guess depending on the keywords that you want to build around and the synergies you want to create, um, here are the benefits you're going to get by marking them appropriately. Starting off with the undivided mark of chaos. All mortal and ogreoid slaves to darkness undivided units that are not unique are going to gain the eye of the gods keyword. When a Slaves to Darkness Undivided Hero rolls on the Eyes of the God table, you can re-roll one of the dice. Now we'll talk a bit about the Eyes of the Gods and I'll show you what the new table looks like. In addition, the Undivided Slaves to Darkness Heroes can issue this following command. Slave worthy foes you can issue at the start of the combat phase. A friendly Undivided Slaves to Darkness unit must receive the command, and until the end of that phase you get to add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons that target an enemy hero or a monster. If you take the Mark of Corn, you can add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by Corn Slaves to Darkness units if they make a charge move in the same turn. Now in addition, your Corn Slaves to Darkness heroes can issue this following command, now you can issue Let the Blood Flow at the start of your charge phase, and a friendly Corn Slaves the Darkness unit must receive this command. After that unit makes a charge move, you get to pick one enemy unit within one inch and roll a dice. On a 2-up, they're going to suffer D3 Mortal Wounds. The Mark of Zinch lets you roll a dice each time a spell targets a friendly Zinch Slaves to Darkness unit, and a roll of a 6, that spell is going to have no effect. In addition, your Zinch Slaves to Darkness Wizards are going to know this following spell called Warp Reality. Warp Reality is a spell with a casting value of 6 and a range of 9. Now if successfully cast, you can pick one friendly Zinch Slaves to Darkness unit that's visible to the caster, and you get to remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up again within range of the caster and more than 9 inches away from enemy units. If you take the Mark of Nurgle, you get to subtract one from the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons that target a Nurgle Slaves the Darkness unit. In addition, your Nurgle Slaves the Darkness heroes can issue the following command. Bestow Contagion is a command ability that you can issue at the start of the combat phase, and a friendly Nurgle Slaves the Darkness unit must receive the command. Now after this unit fights for the first time in that phase, you can roll a dice for each enemy unit that's within 3 inches of the unit, and on a 3-up they're going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. 
Finally, you have the Mark of Slanesh, and that adds one to the run and charge rolls for Slanesh Slave to Darkness units. In addition, Slanesh Slaves to Darkness units can issue the following command. Closing for the kill can be issued at the start of the charge phase, and a friendly Slanesh Slaves to Darkness unit must receive the command. Now that unit can run and charge in the same turn. On top of the Marks of Chaos, you have Vows of Darkness. Now, Vows of Darkness allows you to issue the following heroic actions. For a friendly Slaves to Darkness hero that has the Eyes of the Gods keyword, instead of issuing your heroic leadership, heroic recovery, etc., etc., those universal ones. There are two of them you can choose from, the first one being Pledge to the Dark Gods. Pick one friendly Slaves to Darkness hero with the Eyes of the Gods keyword, and until the end of that turn, each time you roll on the Eyes of the Gods table for that hero, you can roll three dice instead of two, and you can pick two of the dice rolls to be your score. This will make much more sense literally when I click the button in a second. The other one is Draw on Power, and you get to pick one friendly Slaves to Darkness wizard, and until the end of that turn, when you make a casting roll for that wizard, you get to roll three dice instead of two. However, if the unmodified roll for two or more of the dice is a one, the spell is going to be miscast and the wizard is going to suffer d6 mortal wounds instead of d3, your traditional miscast. So what on earth is the Eyes of the Gods table if you're unfamiliar with it, or what has changed if you were familiar from the old book? Because it has been reworked a little bit. At the end of each phase, for every enemy hero or monster that is destroyed by a friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that has the Eye of the Gods keyword, including those destroyed by abilities or spells used by those Slaves to Darkness units, you get to make one roll on the Eyes of the Gods table for that Slaves to Darkness unit and apply the following effect. Now you can see here there is a series of effects that go from 2 to 12. You obviously might want to pause it. I'm not going to go through each of them, but I do want to call out a couple of changes. In addition, if you gain control of an objective that was previously controlled by your opponent, you get to make one roll on the Eyes of the Gods table for each friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that has those Eyes of the Gods keyword that's contesting the objective. Now previously it was only for Slaves to Darkness heroes, it triggered at the end of the combat phase, but you also never got a chance to roll on the Eyes of the Gods table if you took control of a enemy controlled objective. Now, you'll see on the table from 2 to 12, some of it has carried over from the old book, some of it has moved around. I'm going to call out the changes. When it comes to Spawndom, um, Spawndom previously allowed you to make the choice of either turning your hero into a spawn, and if you did, you'd suffer D3 mortal wounds if you elected not to turn it into a spawn. Unfortunately, that's gone. If you roll a double one on the Eyes of the Gods table, you are forced to remove that hero and turn it into a Chaos Spawn. You did lose Murderous Mutation, which was plus one attack, and you also lost Iron Flesh, which was plus one to save. Flames of Chaos went from a 4-up spell shrug to a 2-up shrug only for the next time that you're affected by a spell or an endless spell. There are two ways to get a ward save now. There is both a 5-up ward and a 6-up ward option. You have lost the ability to summon from the Demonic Legions on a roll of a 10, so you used to be able to bring on some demons. Unfortunately, that's completely disappeared. Um, 11 and 12 still lets you turn your hero into a Demon Prince. But you've also gained a couple of new ones. There is a D3 heal. There is a plus one to charge rolls. There is an improver melee Ren characteristic by one. Uh, there's also an ability to turn a non-wizard into a wizard. Or if it is a wizard, it gets an extra spell cast. There are eight command traits to choose from. Four being for your Slaves of Darkness heroes and another four for your Demon Princes. Starting off with your Slaves to Darkness heroes, you have Death Dealer, Favored of the Pantheon, Arch Sorcerer, and Idolator Lord. Death Dealer once per battle in the combat phase, after the general has fought for the first time in that phase, you can say that they will deal death. And if you do so, the general can fight for a second time in that phase. However, the strike last effect is going to apply for the general when they fight for the second time. Now, Favored of the Pantheon is only available for the Eyes of the Gods hero. And after deployment, you can roll once on the Eye of the Gods table for your general. Arch Sorcerer is for wizards only, and this general is going to know all of the spells from the Lore of the Damned, in addition to any other spells that it knows. 
Finally, you have Idolator Lord, and this general is going to become a priest. In addition, you can choose to replace the undivided keyword on every undivided cultist in your army with either the Korn, Zinch, Nurgle, or Slanish keyword. Now, all of your cultist units must be given the same keyword, uh, and it must be the one that is on the general too. Now, when it comes to your Demon Princes, you have Not To Be Denied, Bolstered By Chaos, Radiance Of Dark Glory, and Diabolic Majesty. Not to be denied in each hero phase, once you've carried out a heroic action, if you didn't carry it out with the general, you can carry out an additional heroic action with your general. Now the heroic action that you use with the general cannot be the same one as the one that you carried out earlier in that phase, so you couldn't have two bites of the apple to generate the extra CP for example. Bolstered by Chaos is going to give two extra wounds to your general, in addition it makes them become a monster. Radiance of Dark Glory, at the start of your hero phase, you get to roll a dice for each friendly model within 9 inches of the general, and it has wounds allocated to them. On a 3+, plus, they can heal 1 wound, but if they're a monster, they can actually heal 3 wounds. Finally, Diabolic Majesty is for Undivided Demon Princes only, and once per battle when you carry out a heroic action with the general, you can carry out any of the heroic actions on its war scroll, even if it doesn't have the right keywords, and this will make much more sense later in the video when we see the Demon Prince keywords and what it actually gets within the heroic actions. Now of the command choices, I'm initially drawn to either Arch Sorcerer to access all of the spell laws, or if you're a bit of a gambler, you might like early access to the Eyes of the Gods table by using the Favorite of the Pantheon. For your Demon Prince, I like Radiance of Dark Glory to create a healing bubble, or Bolstered by Chaos to make your Demon Prince a 12 wound characteristic, and also gain the monster keyword that's going to give me a bit more objective control, as well as monstrous rampage access. There are also 9 artifacts to choose from, 3 for your Slaves to Darkness heroes, 3 for your Wizards, and 3 for your Demon Princes. With your heroes, you have the Hellfire Sword, the Helm of the Oppressor, and the Conqueror's Crown. The Hellfire Sword lets you pick one of the bearer's melee weapons, and if the unmodified wound roll for the attack made by that weapon is a 6, it is going to cause a number of mortal wounds equal to the damage characteristic of that weapon, and the sequence ends. Helm of the Oppressor is going to stop enemies from receiving Inspiring Presence or Rally while they're within 6 inches of the bearer. The Conqueror's Crown will stop enemy models with a wounds characteristic of 1 or 2 that are within 6 inches of the bearer. It'll stop them from contesting objectives. With your Slaves to Darkness Wizard, you have the Chaos Familiar, the Infernal Puppet, and the Helm of Eldritch Command. The Chaos Familiar once per battle, at the start of your hero phase, you can say that the bearer will call upon the Chaos Familiar. If you do so, the bearer can attempt to cast one extra spell in that hero phase, and that spell can be any from the Law of the Damned. Infernal Puppet once per battle, at the start of the enemy hero phase, you can pick one enemy wizard within 24 inches of the bearer, and it's visible to them. Until the end of that phase, each time that wizard attempts to cast a spell, they're going to suffer d3 mortal wounds before they make a spell casting attempt. If the wizard is slain by these mortal wounds, the casting attempt is going to fail. Finally, you have the Helm of Eldritch Command. When the bearer attempts to dispel an endless spell, if the dispel roll is greater than the casting value for that endless spell, instead of removing it and dispelling it from the table, your bearer is actually going to take it over. They're going to steal the endless spell and they're going to control it in the same manner as if your wizard summoned it, even though you didn't choose it on your list or you didn't actually summon it uh, in the first place. If you do so, the bearer is going to take control of that endless spell in the same manner as if they casted it. So you get to move it around if it's predatory, you get to throw it back into your enemy and do damage. Now if your opponent does dispel it later on and they summon it back again, uh, you don't control it un unless you use the Helm of Eldritch again. Finally, with your Demon Princes, you have the Helm of Many Eyes, the Doombringer Blade, and the Realm Warp Twist Rune. The Helm of Many Eyes will give the strike first effect to the bearer. The Doombringer Blade at the start of the first battle round after you've set up but before the first turn begins, you get to pick one enemy hero or enemy monster on the battlefield. If you do so, you get to add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly units that target that unit. 
Finally, the Realm Warper's Twist Rune is once per battle in your hero phase, you can pick one terrain feature within 12 inches of the bearer, and you get to roll the dice for each model within one inch of that terrain feature. For each six, that model's unit is going to suffer one mortal wound, and in addition, until your next hero phase, that terrain feature is going to block visibility in the same manner as your Wildwoods. Now, when it comes to your artifact choices, the ones that I'm initially drawn to from the book would be the Helm of the Oppressor to shut down Inspiring Presence and Rally. That one really stood out for me if I'm taking a list that doesn't involve Archeon. The Helm of Eldritch Command, I think, is going to be great, and it's going to punish your opponents while Endless Spells are popular. Throw that Purple Sun, Gnashing Jaws, Quicksilver Swords, or a Predatory Endless Spell from their faction back at your opponent's face. While the Doombringer Blade or the Helm of Many Eyes would be my favorite Demon Prince artifacts, the Helm of Many Eyes would be great for a Demon Prince that's built around being a combat threat, maybe a corn marked one, or the Doombringer Blade might be great for buffing up my troops to help me pull down one of those big hero monster threats like a Mega Gargant. Within Slaves to Darkness, there is only one unique spell law, and that is the Law of the Damned. In addition, I'm going to show you off a quite a unique enhancement set called the Ensorcelled Banners. The Law of the Damned is for Slaves to Darkness hero wizards, including your unique units. Now, you have lost a couple of spells like the Whisper of Chaos, the Mask of Darkness, and Call to Glory, but you do have Binding Damnation, Spite Tongue Curse, Chaotic Conduit, Ruinous Vigor, and Demonic Speed. Binding Damnation is cast on a 7 and a range of 12, and if successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster, and until your next hero phase, the Strike Last effect is going to apply to that unit. Spike Tongue Curse has a casting value of 3 and a range of 12, and if successfully cast, you get to pick one enemy unit that is in range and visible of the caster, and that unit is going to suffer 3 mortal wounds. Wait a second, that sounds too good. What's the catch? Well, if the casting roll is unsuccessful or the spell is unbound, you are going to suffer 3 mortal wounds. Chaotic Conduit is a spell that's cast on a 7 and a range of 12, and if successfully cast, you can pick one friendly Eye of the Gods unit that's in range and visible of the caster, and you can immediately roll on the Eyes of the Gods table for that unit. Ruinous Vigor is a casting value of 6 and a range of 12, and if successfully cast, pick one friendly Slaves to the Darkness monster that's wholly within range and visible to the caster. Until the start of your next hero phase, you get to use the top row of the damage profile, regardless of how many wounds that it's suffered. Finally, my personal favorite is Demonic Speed, casting value of 6 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, you can pick one friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that has a mount and is wholly within range and visible to the caster. Until the start of your next hero phase, when they attempt to charge, they can charge if they're within 18 inches of the enemy instead of 12, and they can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when making a charge move until the start of your next hero phase. Alright, so let's talk about these Ensorcelled Banners. Now, an Ensorcelled Banner is a unique enhancement for Slaves to Darkness. You can always take one Ensorcelled Banner enhancement for a Slaves to Darkness army. Now, each time you take an Ensorcelled Banner enhancement, you can pick one Ensorcelled Banner from the table below and give it to a standard bearer either in a Chaos Chosen unit, a Chaos Warrior unit, or a Chaos Knight unit. Now, if there's a rule that allows you to take an extra enhancement, let's say Warlord Battalion or Commanding Entourage Battalion, you can choose to take an extra Ensorcelled Banner enhancement as that extra enhancement, but you can't pick the same one more than once. And neither can you give one unit two banners. You will notice most of these banners are marked against the Chaos God, so again, the Mark of Chaos is going to be important. Uh, the Blasphemous Icon, when this model is on the battlefield, you can subtract one from chanting rolls for prayers chanted by priests that don't have the Chaos keyword. The Dread Banner is for undivided units only. Each time this unit rolls on the Eyes of the Gods table, you can roll two dice instead of one and pick one of them to be your roll. The Banner of Rage is for Corn units only, and you can add 1 to wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by this unit. The Blasted Standard is for Zinch units only, and this unit is going to get a ward of 4 plus for attacks made by missile weapons that target the unit. The Eroding Icon is for Nurgle units only, and you get to worsen the Ren characteristic of melee weapons used by enemy models by 1 while they're wholly within 12 inches of the Eroding Icon. 
Finally, the banner of Screaming Flesh is for Slanish units only, and you get to add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's melee weapons if they've made a charge move in this turn. Of the spell choices, Demonic Speed is easily my favourite to give me a 3d6 charge on my Varangard, my Chaos Knights, my Chosen, or any of my key threats. I also really dig the Binding Damnation to cause my enemy to strike last. You start to see some really good synergies between the Mark of Chaos and the Ensorcelled Banners. Uh, the Banner of Rage, for example, will combine nicely with that Mark of Corn to boost the damage output of the unit, right? You're going to get plus one attack and plus one to wound in melee. While if I look at the Eroding Icon, again, combined with the Mark of Nurgle, that's going to really grind down and pin your opponent and create some really good durability with the minus one to wound and reducing the rend by one. I also don't mind the Slanesh combination coming in for a plus one to run and charge rolls, as well as plus one attack on the charge when you've got the banner. You've got six sub-factions to choose from and you'll recognize them all from the previous battle tome. When a host of the ever chosen unit that is a Chaos Chosen, a Chaos Knight, a Chaos Warrior or a Varangard unit receives the rally command, you can return a slain model on a four up instead of a six. In addition, you can pick one extra ensorcelled banner for your army. Legion of the First Prince has had a significant rewrite, and at the start of your hero phase, you can pick one Legion of the First Prince undivided unit, and then pick one of the following marks of chaos, whether it's Corn, Zinch, Slanesh, or Nurgle. Now that unit is going to have that mark of chaos until the start of your next hero phase, in addition to the undivided mark of chaos. Now, if you were to pick a wizard and give it the Zinch keyword, uh, it would also know the Warp Reality spell until the start of your next hero phase. You also get the Infernal Servants and Allied Bloodletters, Horrors of Zinch, Plague Bearers, and Demonet units are going to benefit from the Mark of Chaos battle traits as if they had the Slaves to the Darkness keyword. Knights of the Empty Throne units that have a mount can run and still charge in the same turn. You've also got the Dread Lieutenant, and when you pick the General for your army, if Archaon is not included in your army, you can pick a model in a friendly Varangard unit to be your General. If you do so, that unit gains the Leader Battlefield role. In addition, if that General issues the Rally Command and a friendly Varangard unit receives it, they return a slain model on a 5+, plus instead of a 6. Though it's worth calling out that the General cannot be given a Command trait because they're not a hero. Ravages allows you to carry out the following heroic action for a Ravages hero instead of any other heroic action, the universal ones, and that one is called Rally the Tribes, and you get to pick one Chaos Marauder, one Chaos Marauder Horseman, Cultist, or Dark Oath unit in your army that's been destroyed. If you do so, a new replacement unit with half the number of models in that unit that was destroyed, rounding up, is added to your army. You need to set up that unit wholly within 12 inches of the hero that carried out the heroic action, as well as it has to be more than 9 inches away from all enemy units. Now each unit that is destroyed can only be replaced once, and a replaced unit cannot replace itself later on, so you couldn't go from a unit of what, 8 to 4 to 2. Kabbalah's heroes become wizards, and if the hero is already a wizard, they can attempt to cast one additional spell in each of your hero phases, and they also get to know one additional spell from the Law of the Damned, Spell Law. Finally, Despoilers adds two to the wounds characteristic of friendly Despoiler monster units, and in addition, each Despoiler's Demon Prince can be given a command trait in addition to your general, which can be used as if they were the general. Now, each of the command traits that you choose must be different. Now my favourite damned legions would either be the Host of the Ever Chosen, Kabbalist, or the Knights of the Empty Throne. For my type of list, Host of the Ever Chosen easily wins because it gives me a second ensorcelled banner, and it's going to make my army even more durable with a 4-up rally on the Chaos Warriors, the Chaos Knights, the Chosen, and the Varangard. These are all the units that I want to build my army around. It could make a unit of Chaos Warriors or Chaos Knights incredibly hard to shift, especially if I gave them the Mark of Nurgle. Sadly, this is the end of the old Legion of the First Prince abilities that gave Bellacor and his demonic legions a unification. I was a little surprised to see this faction disappear as Warhammer 40k has the Chaos Demon Codex, which is an easy transition for someone going from 40k into Sigma.
While there's a bunch of really good sub-faction rules, the other consideration may be your battle line options. Now, Slaves to Darkness is blessed with a large group of universal battle line. That includes your Chaos Chariots, your Chaos Knights, your Chaos Warriors, your Marauders and your Marauder Horsemen, all of your cultists like your Iron Golems, your Sign of the Flame, the Spire Tyrants, your Splintered Fangs, your Corvus Caval, your Unmade, Untamed Beasts, they're all battle line. Now your Chaos Chosen are battle line in Host of the Ever Chosen. Your Varangard are battle line in Host of the Ever Chosen and Knights of the Empty Throne. Ogroid Theridans become battle line for each Ogroid Myrmidon unit that's in your army. And finally your Furies become battle line in Legion of the First Prince. Next up are your Grand Strategies and you have four Grand Strategies as well as six Battle Tactics. Dominating Presence is scored if there is at least one friendly Slave to Darkness unit wholly within each quarter of the battlefield. Follow the Path of Glory is scored if you roll the Dark Apotheosis result on the Eyes of the Gods table once or more during the battle. Bring Ruin to the Realm is completed if at least four battle tactics and every battle tactic you completed was coming from the Slaves to Darkness list. And finally, Master of Dark Ritual is scored if any Slaves to Darkness endless spell is on the battlefield that you set up. And there's also six battle tactics. Enthrall to Chaos picks one objective marker on the battlefield that's within 12 inches of an enemy unit and you complete the battle tactic if there are no enemy units within 12 inches of that objective marker at the end of this turn. Lust for Power lets you pick one friendly Slaves to Darkness hero that has the Eyes of the Gods keyword and you complete it if you roll on the Eyes of the Gods table for that hero during the turn. The March of Ruin picks one friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that has a standard bearer with an ensorcelled banner, and that's not within enemy territory. You complete this battle tactic if at the end of the turn this unit is wholly within enemy territory and within three inches of other friendly units. Iconoclast picks one enemy unit that is a priest or a totem, and you complete the battle tactic if this unit is destroyed in this turn. Champions of Chaos is completed if at the end of the turn there is three or more friendly heroes within three inches of an enemy hero. And finally, Run Them Down is completed if at the end of your turn three or more friendly Slaves to Darkness units made a charge move in this turn. Bring Ruin to the Realm is probably my favorite grand strategy from this selection as it's the one that's most in my control and it's most likely to be achieved. While the battle tactics feel achievable, I guess it depends on how you build your list. Enthrall to Chaos, Lust for Power, Run Them Down, and March of Ruin are probably the ones that I would use more than others. It has a mandatory Slaves to Darkness leader as well as four Slaves to Darkness units that are not Leaders, Behemoth, and Varangard. There's also an optional one Slaves to Darkness Behemoth as well as up to four Slaves to Darkness units that are not Leaders, Behemoths, and Varangard. Now the benefit for taking the Chaos Warband is either that you can be unified to make that a one drop or you can be slayers for a once per battle all out attack or unleash hell. Overlords of Chaos is the other battalion and that requires you to have three Varangard units and you can also add up to another three units of Varangard so bringing your total up to six. Now the benefit is either going to be a unified again for a one drop or you can take Expert, and that will give you either a once per battle, free all-out attack, or all-out defense. Digging into the War Scrolls, and there is a lot of War Scrolls in this book, so I'm going to try to highlight as many of the changes as possible. If I don't mention it, it probably means that either I missed it, or more likely it just didn't change. Now, starting off with the Ever Chosen himself, uh, there was a couple of changes on the War Scroll. There's a change on his wounds characteristic, he gained 5 wounds and is now 25. The Monstrous Claw has seen a change. Previously, it used to be just D6. Now it's a flat figure, but it is tied to your damage table. So it starts at 5 damage, and it'll obviously degrade over time. Speaking of the damage table, it has gotten smaller. So you'll see the damage table is now 0 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and then 21+. plus. The Armour of Morkar has changed, it's now a flat 5-up ward, it previously used to be a 4-up against mortal wounds only, it still has the ability to bounce mortal wounds that can't be negated on a save roll of 6. 
The crown of domination has had a significant and impactful change. It is now stopping enemies receiving rally or inspiring presence while they're within 12 inches of this unit. Formerly, it used to be a bravery boost and it used to debuff enemy bravery. Now you're just shutting down inspiring presence and rally on a 12 inch radius on a massive pie plate base. So that is going to be very powerful. The Eye of Sheeran has changed, and you may recognize this as the former Dark Prophecy, which you used to have on the old Host of the Everchosen rules. Once per battle at the start of your hero phase, if Archeon is in a Slaves to Darkness army that you command and on the battlefield, you can say that you will consult the Eye of Ed Sheeran. If you do so, roll a dice. Now this dice roll is going to replace the priority roll for the next battle round. On a roll of 1 to 3, your opponent must take the first turn in the upcoming battle round, and on a 4 to a 6, you must take the first turn in that battle round. Now, you can't use this ability if there is another Archaeon on the battlefield. You've gained the Favored Warlord ability, and if this unit is a part of a Slaves to Darkness army, after the players have received their starting command points, but before the start of the first battle round, you can pick one of the following Marks of Chaos keywords, being Corn, Zinch, Nurgle, or Slanesh. Now, your Archaeon is going to have this Mark of Chaos for the battle, in addition to the Undivided Mark of Chaos. Finally, the other change that I noticed came from the three-headed titan. It's now a monstrous rampage. So when you carry out a monstrous rampage with Archeon, you can choose from the following list. Filth Spewer will pick one enemy unit within six inches of it, and you get to roll a dice equal to the number of models in that unit to a maximum of seven. For each three plus on those dice rolls, that unit suffers one mortal wound. Skull Gorger picks one enemy model within three inches of it, and you get to roll a dice. If the roll is greater than the model's wound characteristic, it's slain, and you get to heal. And you get to heal the number of wounds allocated to the Archeon equal to the enemy model's wound characteristic. So if you eat a two wound model, you heal two wounds. Finally, you've got Spell Eater, and that allows you to pick one endless spell within 12 inches of this unit, and you roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that Endless Spell is dispelled, and if the caster is on the battlefield, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. Next up is your updated Slaves to Darkness Demon Prince. The move characteristic has changed. It was 12, it's down to 8, but if you choose to take your Demon Prince with wings instead of the Trophy Rack, it's back to 12-inch move. The other change I noticed is that the Wounds characteristic has gone from 8 up to 10, there was a bunch of changes on the melee profile. Your Demonic Axe gained two extra attacks, so it's now five. The Talons gained five attacks, so it's now eight. The Hellforged Sword is gaining an extra attack. It's now at five. And the Hit and the Wound had swapped, so it's now hitting on threes and wounding on fours. The rest is the same. It did lose Bounding Charge. Hellforged Sword is now dealing D3 Mortal Wounds instead of two Mortal Wounds on an unmodified six. Uh, it did lose the Blood Sickle Grounds, Arcane Influence, Bloated Blessing, Revel in Agony command abilities. Immortal Champion has changed and it's now a heroic action with multiple options depending on the keyword that you give to your Demon Prince. So if you like Strike First, uh, you can still make your Demon Prince Strike First with the Undivided keyword. Uh, if you go with Corn until the end of the turn, each time an enemy model is slain by wounds allocated from attacks made by this unit, you get to heal one wound. With the Zinch Demon Prince, if it is the enemy hero phase, you can roll a dice each time a spell targets the demon prince on a two plus that spell has no effect to this unit and if it's your hero phase this demon prince can attempt to cast one spell from the law of the damned in the same manner as if it was a wizard if this demon prince is already a wizard this spell is in addition to any other spells that it can cast nurgle demon princes can shut down enemy ward rolls while they're within three inches of it while a Slanish Demon Prince, if it makes a charge move, gets to add one to the attack characteristic of its melee weapons until the end of the turn. The other change that I noticed on the Demon Prince is it's gained a 6-up ward. Eternus is the new champion of the First Prince. He has a move of 10, a save of 3, a bravery of 9, and 9 wounds. Eternus has 3 melee profiles and no ranged attack. The Death Glaive has a 2-inch range, 
five attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, rend two for two damage. The skull flail has a range of two, six attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, rend one for one damage. And then the tearing fang has a range of one, three attacks, hits on fours, wound on threes, rend one for one damage. In addition to all of this, uh, Eternus has three key abilities you want to know. The first one is Blade of the First Prince, and it has the Strike First effect uh, if it makes a charge move in the same turn. Network of Spies at the start of the hero phase, if this unit is within one inch of a friendly Chaos Legionnaires or a Furies unit, it's going to gain an extra command point. And the Veins of the Black Lightning at the end of your movement phase if this unit has been slain, you get to roll 2d6 and add 1 if Bellacor is in the army and on the table. On an 8+, plus, you can return this unit back onto the battlefield anywhere, as long as it's outside of 9 inches from enemy units, and all wounds allocated to Eternus have been removed. It has the Chaos Slaves the Darkness, Legion of the First Prince, Undivided, Mortal, Hero, Chaos Lord, and Eternus keywords. I really dig this unit, although I think Bellacor and Eternus combining to improving that returning back from the dead might be an expensive trick, unless you have greater plans with Bellacor. I still think they're great units, especially if you want to run Legion of the First Prince, um, but I do love this uh, model. Next up is your Ogroid Myrmidons, and there has been a change to the Gladiator Spear, which has a melee now of four attacks. It used to be uh, six, but it has improved its damage characteristics. So it's now damage two. It used to be damage one. It did lose the Great Horns profile uh, completely. Berserk Rage has had a change, and you get to add one to wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by this unit. If any wounds or mortal wounds were allocated to the Ogroid Myrmidon, earlier in the same phase. It did lose the Pit Marshal ability that gave Battleshock immunity to cultists, uh, but it did gain the Mark of Chaos keyword as well. Ogroid Theridans are the new unit that's being released within this battle box that I can only assume that will be released separately in 2023. The unit has a move of 6, a save of 5, a bravery of 6, and 5 wounds apiece. There is two weapon profiles. You've got the Falcon and you've got the Great Axe. Uh, the Falcon has a 2-inch range, uh, 3 attacks each, hits on a 3, wounds on a 3, rend 1 for 2 damage, while the Great Axe has a range of 2 as well, 3 attacks, hitting on 3s, wounding on 3s, rend 2 for 3 damage. Now the unit can be built either to be having the uh, Goran, Falchion, and Shield, or the Great Axe. Now, whatever your weapon selection is, the whole unit has to have the same one. One model in this unit can become the champion, and that model will get plus one attack. Uh, one in every three models can be a standard bearer, and the standard bearer will give them plus one bravery. Uh, and one in every three can be a musician, and that will give you plus one to charge rolls. Now, if you decided to choose the Falcon and Shield, that will change the save characteristic for, uh, to be a 4 instead of a 5. It does have the same Berserker Rage that we just spoke about with the Ogroid Myrmidon, where you get plus 1 to wound rolls if the unit has suffered any wounds or mortal wounds earlier in the same phase. You've got Unleash Savagery, which is an ability once per battle. When this unit is picked to fight, you can say that it unleashes their Savagery. If you do so, you get to add one to the attack characteristic of its melee weapons until the end of the phase. However, this unit cannot receive Inspiring Presence in the same turn that it unleashed its Savagery. Finally, the keywords that you'll need to know about is the Chaos, Slaves to Darkness, Mark of Chaos, Ogroid, and Ogroid Theridans. There were no changes to the Centurion Marshal or the Chaos Legionnaires, who were both recently added to Slaves to Darkness via Warcry. I've put the rules up on screen in case this is the first time you've seen them. However, they're also in the AOS app right now for you to check out. Speaking of Bellacor and his mates, most of Bellacor's profile has remained unchanged. The only thing that I noticed was the damage table has been changed. It's now 0 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 11, and 12 plus. 
You may have seen the Gaunt Summoner's War Scroll change in the Disciples of Zinch Battle Tome, and it appears the War Scroll is essentially duplicated here, except a minor tweaks. So the changed staff has gained two attacks, it now wounds on a three, it has rend one, and it does flat one damage. The Warp Tongue Blade has gained an extra attack, now two attacks, uh, it wounds on a three, rend one is two, and does d3 damage instead of one. It did lose the Warpstone Blade ability, which would do D6 Mortal Wounds if you roll a 6 to wound. There was a change on the Book of Profane Secrets, and you get to add 1 to the casting, dispelling, and unbinding rolls for this unit. And in addition, it knows all of the spells from the Lore of the Damned. The Lords of the Silver Tower is a new ability. Once per battle, at the end of a phase, you can pick one enemy hero that is within 9 inches of this unit and that has made an attack that has targeted this unit in this phase or has caused any mortal wounds to this unit with an ability or a spell in this phase, even if those wounds or mortal wounds were negated. If you do so, you get to roll 2d6, and if the roll is greater than the wound characteristic of that hero, the hero is immediately removed from play. The other new ability is the Silvered Portal, and after you've set up the Gaunt Summoner, and when you would normally set up another friendly Zinch unit that's not a monster, you can say that it's going to be in the Gaunt Summoner Silver Tower as a reserve unit. Now up to two units can be put into reserve this way, and at the end of any of your movement phases, you can set up one or more of these units on the battlefield, so long as they're wholly within nine inches of this Gaunt Summoner, and more than nine inches away from enemy units. If at the start of the fourth battle round, they aren't put on the table, the unit is destroyed. The other change is internal flames. You get to roll five dice instead of three when you target a monster or a war machine. The Gaunt Summoner on disc has basically the same rules as the Gaunt Summoner on foot. The only difference is it's now a 4 plus save. I think it was a 6 before, but otherwise it's the same as the Gaunt Summoner. It's still a bit more expensive, a little bit faster, but it's the same rules. The Chaos Lord has gained a retinue, and at the start of the first battle round, before determining who has the first turn, you can pick one friendly Chaos Warriors or Chaos Chosen unit on the battlefield to become this Chaos Lord's retinue. You lost Spurred by the Gods, which was a command ability that let you fight twice. It's gained the Warlord's retinue, and essentially what that means is that retinue unit that you chose, the Chaos Warrior or the Chaos Chosen unit, if the Chaos Lord is within 3 inches of its retinue, on a 3 plus when the Chaos Lord takes damage, it would pass on the wound or a mortal wound to that chosen unit of warriors or chosen instead. It also gained glory in battle and after this unit has fought in the combat phase for the first time, if the retinue has not fought in the combat phase and it's within 3 inches of an enemy and wholly within 12 inches of its Chaos Lord, the unit can immediately fight. The Chaos Lord on Karkadrak has its bravery boosted up to 9. The Battle Axe has gone down to 4 attacks but it has gained Rend so it's now Rend 1. The Demon Bound Blade is Rend minus 2. The Horns and Claws are now 4 attacks each and you did lose the Battering Tail profile. You lost the Fuel by Carnage, which was a D3 heal if it killed something with the Battle Axe. But the other change was in the Knights of Chaos, where the Strike First ability is going to apply if it makes the charge move in the same turn. In addition, if this unit has made a charge move in the same turn, after the unit has fought in the combat phase for the first time, you can pick one friendly Chaos Knight, Chaos Chariot, or Gorbeast Chariot unit, that is wholly within 12 inches of this Chaos Lord on Karkadrak that hasn't fought yet in this phase, and then that unit can immediately fight. Next up is the Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount. It's had a save boost, so it used to be a 4-up save, it's now a base of 3-up. It's Bravery 2 is now Bravery uh, 9. You've gained a different weapon profile called the Chaos Lance, which is a 2-inch range, 4 attacks, hits on 3s, wounds on 3s, rend 1 for 1 damage. It's an alternative loadout to the Warhammer. It's not you get both, it's one or the other. And you do gain plus 1 damage and an improvement of rend by 1 if the Chaos Lance has made a charge move in that same turn. It too lost the Field by Carnage ability, and it has the same Knights of Chaos rule that I just spoke about on the Chaos Lord on Karkadrak.
The Chaos Lord on Manticore has a base move of 12 now. Previously, it was an asterisk. It was still 12, but it was tied to the damage table. It's now, regardless of how much damage the Chaos Lord on Manticore has taken, it's now a flat move of 12. The Bravery also is 9, going up from an 8, and there is no damage table at all on the Chaos Lord on Manticore. The Demon Blade is now Rend 2. Uh, the Lance is now uh, 1 inch range, and it's now Rend 1 or Rend 2 on the charge. The Flail is now damage 2. The Honed Fangs is now 2 up to wound, and the Shredding Tail is 4 attacks. The Chaos Rune Shield now changes the save characteristic to a 3 up, and it still has kept the 5 up ward save against mortal wounds. Your Territorial Predator is now plus one damage against enemy monsters, and there's also a change in Iron Willed Overlord. And if this unit issues the redeploy command to a Slaves the Darkness unit, you can re-roll the dice that determines the distance for the unit when it redeploys. Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore has the same move change, so previously it was an asterisk. The damage table has disappeared, it's now a flat move of 12. The Honed Fangs and the Shredding Tail changes that were on the Chaos Lord on Manticore are the same as well. There is a change in Oracular Visions, and it's the same ability that you used to have, but instead of giving plus one to save, it's now issuing a six-up ward. The other change is in the Winds of Chaos, and it's the same spell. The casting value has increased from a seven to an eight, but the benefit's going to be on a six, the enemy is going to suffer two mortal wounds as opposed to the D3 mortal wounds. The Chaos Sorcerer Lord has a boost in its bravery. It's gone from 7 to 8. It too has the same oracular vision that the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore's got. And the Demonic Power is the same spell, but it's going to issue plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound instead of re-rolling that it used to give. The Dark Oath Chieftain has a wounds characteristic of 5. It's gone down slightly from 6. The Cursed Broadsword is now a 2-inch range. It's got 4 attacks instead of 3. And it's now 3 plus to hit, where it used to be 4 up to hit. Uh, it lost its Berserker Charge, which used to give you plus 3 attacks when it charged. There is a change in Death Blow. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by the Cursed Broadsword is a 6, the attack is going to inflict one mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. It's gained an ability called the Oath of Murder. Now, the first time an enemy hero or a monster is slain by wounds allocated from attacks made by the Dark Oath Chieftain, the unit's oath is fulfilled. Once this unit fulfills its oath, until the end of the battle, the strike first effect is going to apply to this Dark Oath Chieftain. It's gained a rule called the Tribal War Leader, and after this unit has fought in the combat phase for the first time, you can pick one friendly Dark Oath unit that's not yet fought in that combat phase, is within 3 inches of an enemy, and wholly within 12 inches of this Dark Oath Chieftain. That unit can then immediately fight. Finally, it gained the Undivided Keyword, and you're going to notice a lot, if not all of the cultists, have gained the Undivided Keyword. Next up, you have the Dark Oath War Queen that has a save characteristic now 4, it used to be 5. The Rune Etch Axe is now 4 attacks, it used to be 6, but the damage characteristic has improved. It used to only be 1 damage, it's now 2 damage. The Infernal Rune Shield is now a ward save of 5, and it still bounces mortal wounds on 6s. It lost the Savage Duelist, and as well as it lost the Will of the Gods, but it gained the Oath of Supremacy, and at the end of the movement phase, if this unit is wholly within enemy territory, it's going to fulfill its Oath. Once the unit has fulfilled its Oath, until the end of the battle, if this unit issues the Inspiring Presence command, up to two friendly Dark Oath or Cultist units can receive the command. It also gained the Tribal War Leader ability that I just spoke about on the Dark Oath Chieftain. It too gained the Undivided Keyword. Next up, you've got the Exalted Hero of Chaos. Now, it's gained a wound. It used to be five wounds. It's now six wounds. The Rune Etch Blade is now four attacks. It used to be a random D6. And it's now flat two damage. It used to be only one. It's gained a new melee profile called the Axes of the Dark Champion. It has a range of one, eight attacks, hits on a four, wounds on a four, rend minus one, and two damage apiece. Now you'll gain access to this new weapon profile if you don't equip your Exalted Champion with a shield. 
if you do have the shield, the Chaos Rune Shield will change the save characteristic to a 3-up instead of a 4-up, and you'll also be able to ignore mortal wounds on a 5-up. You've gained a new version of the Dark Blessing, so after deployment you can roll once on the Eyes of the Gods table for this unit. Uh, you will recognize this potentially, it's just a recycled name, it's just different. Um, you've lost the ability called the Glory Hungry Bladesman, you've also lost the Thrice Damned Dagger as well as the Trail of the Red Ruin, but you have gained a rule called Glory Seeker. And Glory Seeker is going to add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's melee weapon, if it's within three inches of an enemy hero or enemy monster. Next up is our Chaos Warriors, and we've seen the save characteristic change from a 4-up to a 3-up, though it did lose the pair of hand weapons and the Great Blade um, weapon loadout. Now, the Chaos weapon is now Rend minus 1. The hit and the wound profile switch, so it's now hitting on 4s and wounding on 3s, and it's Rend minus 1. The, there is a change when it comes to the standard bearers and the musicians. It's now one in every 10 as opposed to one in every five. You have lost the Legions of Chaos, which used to give you plus one to save if this unit had 10 or more. But really, that plus one to save has already been integrated to that three up save characteristic change. Finally, you've got the Bringers of Desolation, which adds one to the attack characteristic of this unit's melee weapon while it's wholly within enemy territory or if it's wholly within 12 inches of an objective that you don't control. Chaos Knights also had a save characteristic change. It went from a 4-up save to a 3-up save. There was a change within Sorcelled Weapons. It's gone from a 3-plus to hit. It's now a 4-plus to hit, though it is damage 2. It used to only be damage 1. The Lance now has 3 attacks and Rend minus 1. The Flail is now a flat 6 attacks, and it's 3-ups to hit instead of 4-ups to hit. The Musician has received a change, so when you make a charge roll, you can change one of the dice rolls to be a 4. It lost the Terrifying Champions rule, which was minus 1 Bravery Bubble to enemies within whatever. You've gained a new ability called the Riders of Doom. Now, when a model in this unit makes an attack with its Cursed Lancers, instead of using the range characteristic for that attack, you can target an enemy unit that's within half an inch of another model in this unit that's within half an inch of the attacking model. Now that sounds very complex, but essentially if you've already been playing in the current General's Handbook and you know the Bonds of Battle rule, it basically just lets you fight in two ranks. So if you do take a unit of 10, maybe even 15 Chaos Knights, it's going to allow you to fight in two ranks, even though the range of the Lancers wouldn't normally get you in range to do two ranks of attacks. The other change on the Chaos Knights is the Impaling Charge. Now that does plus one damage and plus one rend when it charges. It used to be rend minus two with no base rend profile. It's basically the same outcome. You know, on without the charge, you're rend now minus one. On the charge, you're rend minus two. So you've got a little bit more consistency when you're not charging. Finally, you've got your Varen Guard and Ensorcel Weapons have five attacks. It used to be six attacks, but the damage characteristic has improved. So it's gone from one damage to two damage. The Fell Spear is three plus to wound and the Rend is now minus two. It will be Rend minus three on the charge when you combine that with the Impaling Charge ability. The Demon Forge Blade is now Rend minus two and the Tearing Fangs are now Rend minus one. You did lose the ability called the Favor of the Ever Chosen, which used to give you plus one to hit if Archeon is on the table. And you've seen a change in the Warp Steel Shield. It's now a four up ward against mortal wounds. It used to be a five up spell shrug. Chaos Chosen have slightly gotten slower. They're now a base move of five. They used to be six, but they have gained a save characteristic now up to three. It used to be fours. The Bravery has been boosted to eight, and they're now three wounds apiece, where there used to be only two wounds. You've seen a change in the Soul Splitter melee profile. It's now a range of two. It used to only be one, and it too does damage two. It used to only be one. So there's been an improvement there on the, the melee profile. You've got the Icon Bearer is now adding plus one to Bravery instead of debuffing your opponents. And the Musician is now doing plus one to Charge. It used to give you plus one to Run Rolls as well. That part's disappeared. It's only plus one to Charge. You did lose the Slaughter Leader ability, but you gained the Heralds of Ruination, and that is once per battle in the combat phase. 
after this unit has fought for the first time in that phase, you can say that they will unleash Ruin. If you do so, that unit can fight for a second time, but the strike last effect is going to apply when they strike for the second time. The other rule that they've gained is the Rewards of Chaos, and if this unit is a part of a Slaves to Darkness army, after deployment you can roll once on the Eyes of the God table for this unit. Chaos Marauders have seen some changes on their attack profile. Their axe is down to one attack each. They used to be twos. Their flail is now one inch. Uh, they're two attacks each, and their hitting and wound profiles have now switched. The standard bearer and musician are now coming in at one in every ten. It used to be one in every five. The icon bearer is giving plus one to bravery, and musicians are now only plus one to charge. Uh, they lost the plus one to run it as well. If you arm your Marauders with a shield, it's going to change the save characteristic to a 5 instead of being a plus 1 to save, which means you're ultimately going to be better off for that. You did lose the Barbarian Hordes, which was a plus 1 to hit bonus when you had 10 or more models. And there was a change when it comes to Boundless Ferocity, where you now add plus 1 to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit if they made a charge move in the same turn. Now you're gonna be sad for this one because this was the former cheaty dice that turned the lowest charge number into a six when you made the charge. The Chaos Marauder Horsemen, both the Javelin profiles are now four ups to hit. They used to be threes, both in shooting and melee, uh, but they are rend minus one. So you only had rend previously when you shot and it's now consistent both in combat and in melee. The flail is only one inch range now, but it is three attacks, uh, and the hit and the wound profile has now switched, so it's now hitting on threes, wounding on fours, but you did lose the rend on the flail. Um, the icon bearer and the musician is the same as the chaos marauders on foot. The shield change characteristic is consistent as well, so if you equip your chaos marauder horseman with a shield, the characteristic is now a five up save. There was a nice change when it comes to the feigned flight. Uh, they still can retreat and shoot and charge, but they do gain plus one to hit if they did make a retreat move in the same turn. Finally, they gained the Swift Raiders ability where you subtract one from wound rolls for attacks made by missile weapons that target this unit. There's been a couple of changes when it comes to the Chaos War Shrine. The Bravery has increased to be Bravery 8. It's gained two extra wounds and it's now wounds of 14. The damage table has changed, so it's now 0 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 11, and 12 plus. The Protection of the Dark Gods bubble has slightly improved. It's now a range 18, 15, 12, and 9, depending on where you are on the damage table. There has been some big changes when it comes to the favor of the gods. Your prayers are still answered on a three. Uh, the range is still 18. However, you no longer have the flexibility to use multiple prayers from the same war shrine. So when you pick your chaos war shrine and you mark it as Nurgle, you're only going to be able to chant those Nurgle prayers. So there has been some changes as well. The Favor of Chaos Undivided, if answered, lets you pick one friendly undivided unit that's within range and visible to the Chanter, and until the start of your next hero phase, you get to halve the number of models that flee from a failed Battleshock test rounding up. The Favor of Corn, if answered, you get to pick one friendly corn unit that's wholly within range and visible to the Chanter, and add one to the charge rolls made by this unit until the start of your next hero phase. The favor of Zinch, if answered, you get to pick one friendly Zinch unit wholly within range invisible and subtract one from the wound rolls for attacks that target that unit until the start of your next hero phase. The favor of Nurgle, if answered, you pick one friendly Nurgle unit wholly invisible to the Chanter and add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by that unit in melee until the start of your next hero phase. And then finally, the favor of Slanesh, if answered, you pick one friendly Slanesh unit that's wholly invisible to the Chanter, and until the start of your next hero phase, you can attempt to charge with that unit if it's within 18 inches of an enemy instead of 12, and in addition, roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when you make that charge move. The Chaos Chariots had a change in the Great Blades. It's now three attacks. It used to only be two. It now hits on fours, though. It used to hit on threes. The Chaos War Flail had, now has six attacks flat. It used to be D6 previously, and it now hits on three, so it's a, a slight boost there. Now, there's an interesting change when it comes to the Chaos Chariots and the Gorebeast Chariots. 
you can choose them either to be individual or you can take a unit of three chaos chariots or a unit of three gore beast chariots when we get towards the end of the video and we look at the points you'll see how it all works but if you do take a unit of three chaos chariots you will get a champion and that champion will have plus one attack Speaking of your Gore Beast Chariots, it has a very similar rule. As I mentioned, you can choose them either to be a unit of one or a unit of three. The champion will give you plus one attack. You did lose the Explosive Brutality and the Crashing Charge. It also gained a cracking rule called Unstoppable Momentum. And at the end of your combat phase, if this unit made a charge move this turn, it can make a normal move even if it's within three inches of an enemy unit. If it does so, it can pass across other models with a wound characteristic of 4 or less in the same manner as if the chariot could fly. Now in addition, after it's made a move, you can pick one enemy unit that it's passed across and roll a dice for each model in that unit. On a 3+, plus, that unit is going to suffer D6 mortal wounds. Looking at our cultists now, we'll start off with our Corvus Caval. You have had a movement reduction. It used to be move of eight, and it's now move of six. The bravery has gone up from five to six. It's gained the undivided keyword, and you'll notice all of the cultists have now got undivided. The Raven darts now wounds on a four, and the hooked weapons have two attacks each. The Shrieking Talons now get a plus one to attack. Uh, it's lost the reroll ones when you made the charge. There's been a change with death from above. This unit is not visible to the enemy while it's in cover. In addition, if this unit attempts to charge while it's wholly within terrain, it can fly when it makes a charge move in that phase. It's also gained a rule called the Denizen of Ulgu. And instead of setting up this unit on the battlefield, you can place it to one side and say it's in the shadows as a reserve unit. If you do so at the end of your movement phase, you can set up this unit anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches from an enemy unit. Any units that are in reserve, they must be put down before the fourth battle round or they're destroyed. With your unmade, they have also gained a boost in their bravery. They're now bravery of six. The attacks for the maiming weapons is now two and the nightmare sickles is now six. The Blissful One can issue commands on their unit. And by the way, you'll notice this across the board. All of the cultists can now issue their own commands, which is awesome. There's a change in Frozen in Fear, and enemy units cannot receive redeploy or rally commands while they're wholly within 12 inches of a friendly unit with this ability. Your Splintered Fang also got a bravery boost. It's now a bravery of six. There has been a change where they get three attacks each now. You've got, they wound on twos and they have gained the undivided keyword. Uh, and much like the unmade, the true blood in the unit can issue commands to their own unit. The Cypher Lords have got a bravery boost as well. They're now bravery six. There's been a change in the exotic blades. They're now two attacks and they hit on three ups. Uh, the Thrall Master can issue their own commands. There is a new rule called Acrobatic Leaps. Now, when this unit makes a move, it can pass across other models in the same manner as if it could fly. And in addition, after this unit makes a move, excluding pylons, you can pick one enemy unit that it's passed across and roll a dice for each model in the unit. For, a, for every six, they're going to suffer one mortal wound, and the Cultist gained the undivided keyword. Signs of the Flame also got the Bravery Boost. They're now Bravery 6. The Blazing Lord can issue commands to its own unit. The Inferno Priest now has the Engulfing Flames Missile Profile. It is range of 8, D6 attacks, hits on 3s, wounds on 3s, no rend for 1 damage. The Immolator, which is now 1 in every 8 models, at the end of the combat phase lets you pick 1 enemy unit within 1 inch of this unit, and you get to roll a dice for each Immolator in this unit. For every 2+, plus, that unit is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. There is a change in All Shall Burn. Now, if an attack is made by the Flame Burst Pots, and it targets an enemy unit with 10 or more models, and it scores a hit, that attack is going to score three extra hits on the target instead of the one. Make the wound and the save rolls as normal. It used to be exploding sixes. I guess now it's just getting more attacks on larger units. It too gained the undivided keyword. The Tarantulous Brood gained the undivided keyword and the Broodmaster can issue its own commands to the unit. 
The Spire Tyrants have had a reduction in their move. It's now a movement of five. Uh, it has a save of now four characteristic and its bravery is six. The Gladiatorial Weapons is now two attacks and the Pit Champion can also issue commands to its own unit and they're gaining plus one attack. It used to be plus two attacks for the Pit Champion. It's now only plus one. The Bestigore Destroyer is now adding plus one damage. It lost the Pit Fighter ability. It gained a rule called the Fight for Glory, and you get to add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's melee weapons while they're wholly within nine inches of a friendly mortal hero. You've gained Veteran of the War Pits, and you're not going to take Battle Shock tests for units while they're within three inches of an enemy, and they've also gained the Undivided Keyword. Iron Golems have seen a change in their Legion weapons, and they're now two attacks each. Uh, the Domineer can issue commands to its own unit. The Ogre Breacher is going to be plus one damage along with its three wounds. The Signifier is adding plus one to bravery. Uh, I, th I think it used to add two to the bravery. It's now just plus one bravery. There's a minor change in the Iron Resilience, and it also has gained the Undivided Keyword. Finally, the Horns of Hashford has had its unit champion, the Ruinator Alpha, can issue its own command to its unit. The Untamed Beasts have seen a bravery boost of plus one. It's now bravery six as well. The Jagged Harpoons are now hitting on threes and doing D3 damage. The Hunting Weapons are now doing two attacks. The Rock Tusk Prowler is adding plus one to damage along with two wounds to the unit. And the Heart Eater can issue commands to its own unit, and it too gained the undivided keyword. The Godsworn Hunt has lost its Pact of Soul and Iron. Uh, there has been minor weapons profiles boosts like um, Fedra's 3 up to, to hit. The Oath of Arcane Apotheosis, it's gained, uh, and that rule is if the unmodified casting role for this unit is a 10 up, it fulfills its Oath. And once this unit fulfills its oath until the end of the battle, this unit can attempt to cast two spells in the hero phase and attempt to unbind two spells in the enemy hero phase. It's also gained the Oath of Conquest, and if you gain control of an objective that was previously controlled by your opponent while this unit was contesting it, it's going to fulfill this Oath of Conquest. Now, when it fulfills the oath until the end of the battle, the unit is going to have a 5-up ward. The unit is going to be a bodyguard for Thedra if it is within 3 inches, and on a 3+, plus, any time you allocate wounds to the champion, on a 3-up you can allocate the wound or the mortal wound to the unit instead. It too gained the undivided keyword. Kradja's Ravagers have a save characteristic of 3-up, and they've got now wounds of 3. The Sorcerer's Staff is now range of 2, it's gone down slightly the Demon Bound Mace is now damage 2, and Sorcerer Blades is now rend minus 1. The Fierce Conquerors uh, is a new rule that the, the Ravengers have, and the models are going to count as 2 for the purpose of contesting objectives. The Unit Champion um, has now a completely separate War Scroll. It's a single caster and single unbinder. It also has the same or oracular visions that the Chaos Sorcerer Lord has. And it has a unique spell called the Mask of Darkness. Now it's a casting value of 6, a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one friendly Kradjurs Ravengers unit wholly within range and visible to the caster. You get to remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up again anywhere on the battlefield wholly within 24 inches of the caster and more than 9 inches away from all enemy units. The Dark Oath Savages have seen the Slaughterborn can now issue its own commands, and the unit has gained the Undivided Keyword. The Fomoroid Crusher has now got a Bravery of 10, it's a big boost from 6 previously. It did lose the Rampage ability. Uh, the Hue and Rocks and Rubble has now added 1 to the damage characteristic of this unit's weapons, while it's within 1 inch of a terrain feature. There has been a change. Uh, insurmountable Strength has become Cursed Destroyers, and in your hero phase you get to pick one terrain feature within 6 inches of this model, and roll a dice for each other unit within 6 inches of that terrain feature, and anything that's in garrisoned in it, and on a 3 plus that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, in addition, if the terrain feature picked was Faction Terrain or Defensible Terrain, and you rolled the 3 up, 
the terrain feature is destroyed if it was defensible, and the scenery rules on the War Scroll can't be used for the rest of the battle if it was faction terrain. Furies did get a boost in their save characteristic, they've gone from a save of nothing to a save of 6 up, and they've seen a bravery go down from 10 to 6. Your Mind Stealer Kitty Cat has seen a minor boost to its bravery, it's now bravery of 10. The Shredding Claws is now 5 attacks, it's gone up from 3 and they're now 2 damage apiece. It did lose the Lashing Tail attacks and the Telepathic Dread which was a minus 2 bravery debuff. There has been a change in Dominate Mind and at the start of each combat phase you pick one enemy unit within 9 inches of this unit and is visible to it and roll 2d6. If the roll is equal or exceeds the bravery characteristic of this unit, the strike last effect is going to apply until the end of the phase. Now, if you've got multiple kitty cats, you can't target the same unit more than once in that phase. Um, it previously was in uh, the hero phase. The range has gotten shorter from 12 to 9, and it's no longer that weird dice game between you and your opponent. It's just a bravery check. The only change I noticed with the Chaos Spawn is a new rule called Drawn to Power. Now while this unit is within 90 inches of a friendly Demon Prince and they share one of the following keywords, be Corn, Zinch, Nurgle, Slanish or Undivided, you can re-roll one of the dice when determining the movement characteristic as well as one of the dice when determining the amount of attacks made by the Freakish Mutation. Finally, these Raptor Bird weird things, you've got a save characteristic of 6, it used to be flat nothing, uh, and you've gained a rule called Dark Symbiosis, and you do not take Battleshock tests for this unit while it's within 3 inches of a friendly monster. The Slaughter Brute has gained 2 extra wounds, so it's now a wound of 14. Uh, there has been a change in the Razor Tip Claws, it's now 8 attacks, it used to only be 6. It did lose the Slashing Talon's melee profile, and it did lose the Beast Unbound ability. Now when you select this unit to be a part of your army, you can choose one Slaves to Darkness hero or one Corn Mortal hero that's in your army to be the master of the Slaughter Brute. Now you've got to write this down on your uh, army list. The unit can receive the following commands if it's issued by its master. Leave None Alive is issued at the start of the combat phase. Now, the unit that issues the command must be the master, and it must be received by the Slaughter Brute. Until the end of that phase, use the top row of the damage table, regardless of how many wounds it suffered. While Let Loose the Change you can use at the start of the charge phase, the unit issuing the command must be the master, and it must be received by the Slaughter Brute. Now, until the end of that phase, you can attempt to charge if it's within 18 inches of an enemy instead of 12, and in addition, you can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when making a charge move. The final change on the Slaughter Brute would be the Unbridled Ferocity, and at the end of the charge phase, if this unit is within 3 inches of an enemy unit and more than 12 inches from its master, pick one enemy unit within 3 inches and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, and the Slaughter Brute is going to suffer one mortal wound. Essentially, it's a tweaked version of the Beast Unbound, but now you're going to hurt yourself a little bit um, with some other minor changes. The Soul Grinder also gained an extra 2 wounds, so it's now a wounds characteristic of 18. Uh, the Piston Driven Legs are now damage 2, and instead of being damage 1. The Mutilith Vortex Beast also gained 2 extra wounds, so it's now wounds of 14. And the damage table has gotten smaller, so it's now much like some of the others. 0 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 11, and 12+. plus. There was no apparent changes when it came to the Endless Spells, the Darkfire Demon Rift, the Eightfold's Doom Sigil, and the Realm Scourge Rapture. All of them seemed to be the same, nothing seemed to change at all. So there were plenty of War Scroll changes, so it makes sense that there were points changes to go with them. Now you did see points reductions, the Chaos War Shrine went down 30 points, the Realm Scourge Rapture Endless Spell went down 25, the Darkfire Demon Rift went down 20, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord and the Demon Prince went down 15, the Eightfold Doom Sigil and the Brood went down 10, Bellacore, Chaos Lord, Chaos Lord on Karkadrak, the Marauder Horsemen, Marauders, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore, Furies, the Soul Grinder, they all went down 5 points. 
but there also was point increases. Your Chaos Chosen got a massive glow up and they went up 95 points. The Ravagers went up 70 points. The Chaos Knights went up 60 points. Iron Golems and the Splintered Fangs went up 25 points. The Chaos Warriors and the Untamed Beast went up 20 points. The Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount, the Chaos Lord on Manticore, and the Chaos Spawn all went up 15 points. The Corvus Caval, the Cypher Lords, the Dark Oath Chieftain, the Dark Oath War Queen, the Exalted Hero of Chaos, the Gaunt Summoner on Disc, the Mutilith Vortex Beast, the Slaughter Brute, the Spy Tyrants, the uh, God Sworn Hunt, the Varen Guard all went up 10 points. And the Ogroid Myrmidon, the Scions of the Flame, and the Unmade all went up 5 points. Now I did mention earlier that the Chaos Chariots and the Gorbeast Chariots could either be run as units of 1 or units of 3. So if you take the Chaos Chariot, it's now 100 points for 1 Chariot or 300 points for 3. There is no middle ground, you can't take 2 in the same unit. Um, the Gorbeast Chariots are either 115 points for 1 or 345 for three. Um, there is no indication in this book that if I take a unit of three Chaos Chariots, that it would fulfill your three battle line requirements in match play. So uh, unfortunately, if you want to like just get some cheeky battle line, you'd be going three units of one. There is so much to unpack here that my summary could be a separate video on its own. I do want to mention on Warhammer Community leading up to this video, there was an article that mentioned in its footnote that the Slaves to Darkness English Battle Tome had a minor print error, and there would be a small errata coming out in the following week. I don't know what the error is or how many of those errors are in this book, so I guess we've got to stay tuned to see the exact lay of the land. Unless you're a Legion of the First Prince player, there's a lot to like about this book. Archeon got a heap better, there's some great sub-faction rules, Ensorcel Banners are a very interesting set of rules, you've got new units, you've got tweaked war scrolls, and you've got a bunch of new sculpts. Much like Cities of Sigma though, this book is really going to come alive when you start to synergize the unit combinations with the Marks of Chaos, and legitimately, I think Slaves the Darkness has just become my 2023 army project. Now keep an eye on the channel because very soon in the coming weeks, I'll be having a couple of discussions with top ranked Slaves to Darkness players and drawing from their experience so we can break this down and starting to put together some lists and how are our top players thinking about Slaves to Darkness. But that's enough for me because we will go much deeper in those other videos that I talked about. I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comment section what you're thinking so far. What do you think about Slaves to Darkness? What do you like? What are some of the things that have glown up? How are you thinking about your list? Are there some combinations, some um, sub-factions, some ensorcelled stuff? Let me know in the comment section. I'd be super curious to hear from you what you're thinking about. And um, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment to let me know what your thoughts are. The conversation will continue over on Discord, and the link is down below in the video description. I want to give a massive shout out as well to the AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members who are going in and the funds are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you're all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a one on a redeploy.